Today's bonus episode features my full interview with Jeffrey Beltwell. Jeffrey Beltwell's most recent scholarly venture includes his research into George Beltwell. We looked at Beltwell and Wilson's relationship in the context of the Free Soil Democratic Coalition in Episode 5, but Beltwell and Wilson's often paralleled careers go much further than the Massachusetts State House. You can learn more about Jeffrey Beltwell's forthcoming book, Redeeming America's Promise, George S. Beltwell in the Politics of Race, Money, and Power, 1818-1905, to on Jeffrey Beltwell's website, www jeffreybeltwell.com. Our conversation was one of my favorites of the series, and I hope you enjoy. is Jeffrey Boutwell. Um, I'm retired after a 30 plus year career in uh, um, international science and public policy issues with a focus mainly on controlling and eliminating nuclear weapons. Uh, I got my PhD from MIT and a combination of political science and technology uh, areas. I uh, had a wonderful, fascinating career uh, working on nuclear weapons, but also other issues like Israeli-Palestinian peace agreements, uh, environmental causes of uh, civil conflict, uh, improving Cuba-U.S. relations through uh, cooperative science programs, things like that. So essentially working on how science can bring countries together and bring uh, the international community together. I've been retired now for, wow, almost 10 years. and. Uh, um, I had always known about George Boutwell growing up. Obviously, he is a family member. Uh, my great-great-grandfather, Rodney Cleves Boutwell, was a farmer in southern New Hampshire. He was the second cousin of George Boutwell uh, in the 1800s. And, of course, Boutwell came from a farming uh, family in Lunenburg, Massachusetts. So I knew about George growing up, but uh, he doesn't get much attention or much play in Massachusetts. He's kind of uh, uh, hiding underneath the radar. But the more I learned about him, the more I was fascinated by his incredibly varied career over 70 years, everything from representative in the Massachusetts legislature to governor, commissioner of internal revenue for Lincoln in the House of Representatives, where he helped frame the 14th and 15th Amendments, secretary of the Treasury for U.S. Grant, then U.S. Senator, and finally after that, working on various international claims commissions but also being president of the Anti-Imperialist League uh, after 1898, opposing American annexation of the Philippines. So got to know about George. And if I can kind of just give you one revelatory, you know, uh, episode, and you might have had one of these as well with Henry Wilson. Uh, I'd always thought about maybe doing a long essay on George just to, to learn more about him. But a uh, good 15, 10, 15 years ago, the revelatory book that I read was called Redemption, The Last Battle of the Civil War uh, by um, uh, head of the uh, Columbia School of Journalism. Um, okay, it's slipping me at the moment. Uh, but it's about white supremacist violence against blacks in the South during Reconstruction. Uh, and among many episodes all across the South, one in particular was the Mississippi Plan of 1875, by which white Southern Democrats terrorized, intimidated, lynched, and murdered Blacks and their white Republican supporters uh, to redeem the state, to take it back for the Democratic Party in the 1875 elections. The following year, the US Senate appointed a select committee chaired by George Boutwell to investigate those atrocities in the South. George, over a four month period, took testimony from witnesses, victims of that violence. The committee traveled to Mississippi in 1876, uh, again, to take firsthand testimony. And in August of 1876, they published a 2000 page report uh, on white supremacist violence against blacks and whites in, South, in the South. Uh, that essentially was an important documentary record of what uh, Southern whites had done to undermine Reconstruction and take back the South. 
So that was the thing that really kind of tipped me over in terms of, I really need to learn more about George Boutwell. One thing led to another and the essay has since, you know, mogrified into a book. Yeah, um, the author, Nicholas Lehman. Nicholas Lehman, yes. Okay, yes. Yep. Yep. Um, no, that sounds, uh, you know, it's very interesting, um, you know, those types of books because it, it's really, um, kind of reshaping how we think about the Civil War and the battle for civil rights and how that kind mm -hmm. of extended beyond just the re Reconstruction era and how that kind of the failed promise of, of you know, the, the civil rights fighters of the day. Um, failed so, promise to quote to Robert Levine. Right, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yes. Um, so uh, kind of just starting off, um, before I actually ask, you know, you can, before you give like a more in-depth kind of, um, biography of, of George Boutwell, um, wh why do you think it's important to remember, um, kind of these mostly forgotten figures like Boutwell and Wilson, um, and many others of, of this era? Uh, main reason I would say is that to me, these are the people who were, uh, fighting in the trenches. Uh, these were kind of the foot soldiers of, abolition, emancipation, equality uh, for blacks, um, reconstruction, 14th and 15th amendments. And by and large, they were the, the people in our uh, constitutional process who were indispensable for moving that process forward. But in doing so, uh, you know, never became president. They never became uh, Supreme Court justice. They were uh, terribly important but they didn't necessarily have the ambition uh, of others who sought even higher office. Uh, and I think in that respect, especially of Sam and Chase. Uh, you know, Chase was a remarkable abolitionist, a remarkable figure uh, um, in the fight for uh, equality of rights, but also overweening ambition. You know, he was never satisfied with where he was. He kept wanting to be president. And in the end, I think that really undermined his, uh, his legacy over time as opposed to people like Boutwell and Wilson, who served in the Senate, uh, served as vice president in Wilson's case to, to US grant, uh, but who just kept you know, the, the kind of slow and steady effort that was needed to push the uh, equal rights agenda forward. Uh, yeah, right, um, I agree with you on that. Um, so uh, just kind of jumping into it, if you wanna give like kind of like, the, I call it like the Wikipedia introductory article bio of like, who is George Boutwell? Um, go ahead. Okay. Um, I guess I might've already done that to some extent in giving a, a capsule history of, of his career. Uh, but in one paragraph, essentially the son of a Massachusetts farming family who was self-educated, never went to college, never went to law school, had a voracious appetite for learning and for knowledge. Uh, when he was working in a dry goods store, and this is very similar to Henry Wilson, when he was working in a dry goods store in the 1830s, early 1840s, he would stay up until you know, one or two o'clock in the morning reading anything he could get his hands on. And uh, he talks about when he uh, would start to nod off at midnight or one o'clock in the morning, he'd throw cold water on his face just so he could get another hour or two of, of learning in. So self-educated, self-disciplined, learned the values of hard work, uh, you know, working on uh, his father's farm as a, a youngster. He never lost that in his uh, 87 years of, of life. Uh, he was just had Yankee determinism, discipline and a doggedness. Uh, to everything that he uh, applied himself to uh, that makes him uh, quite a, a remarkable character. Yeah, very similar to Wilson in their young know, years, um, kind of their aspiration for more um, knowledge and education. Um, and of course, very similar career paths as well, um, especially in the early days, um, which is uh, kind of where my first kind of more in-depth question is. Um, so, uh, when Boutwell was elected to the governorship um, in the early 1850s, um, could you kind of explain that Democratic Free Soil Coalition, um, which, you know, Henry Wilson and George Boutwell kind of um, concocted together? Sure. It's a fascinating story. It's one of my favorite stories of, uh, of Boutwell and, of course, of, of Wilson, too. Uh, 
1840s, Henry Wilson uh, is a Whig, as you know, and then he goes and helps uh, start the Free Soil Party in 1848 because uh, he's dissatisfied with the Whig uh, position on slavery. George Boutwell is a Democrat. They both have come from working class backgrounds. They're both kind of natural Jacksonian Democrats, um, you know, in, in favor of the common man, laborers, farmers and whatnot. Uh, and certainly not in favor of the Boston Brahmins and the elite of Massachusetts who were controlling the Whig party. So Wilson is a Whig, Boutwell is a Democrat. The third person who's important in that, uh, in what becomes a triumvirate is Nathaniel Banks, uh, also a Democrat. Banks goes on to be a political general for Lincoln and goes to higher office as well. But there's a great story that in uh, 1850, the three of them are all serving in the Massachusetts legislature. And one day they leave the state house on Beacon Hill. They walk down to Boston Common and take a stroll around the, the common. And I think it's pretty much Henry Wilson who has the, the primary idea of a coalition between the Free Soil Party, which has just been organized and the Democrats, and especially those Democrats like George Boutwell who are anti-slavery. Uh, Bowell had become increasingly frustrated with the National Democratic Party, uh, which is looking to push slavery into the Western territories, which is de definitely controlled by the Southern White Democrat part of the party. And so Bowell is you know, frustrated with the National Party um, stance on slavery, but he still is enough of a, you know, a, a small D Democrat in, in favor of the working man and laborers that he's not yet ready to, to leave the party. So Wilson proposes a coalition that the Free Soilers and the Democrats can combine against the Whig Party and overturn, you know, Whig dominance in Massachusetts politics. Well, uh, the electoral system of Massachusetts is such that, you know, the party that uh, wins the governorship or, or Senate uh, positions has to have a plurality uh, or has to have a majority of the vote, not just a plurality. So as happened in the 1850 election, Democrats and the Free Soilers, they pool their votes. And even though the Whigs win most of the votes, even if the Whigs win 48% of the vote and say the Free Soilers and Democrats only win 26% each, if they combine those, they get 52% of the vote and they're gonna get their man elected, which is what happened. Uh, Whigs did not have a majority, so it's thrown into the Massachusetts legislature. And that's where Democrat and Free Soil representatives come together and elect Boutwell governor in January of 1851. And a few months later, there's a bit more problem in coming together on Charles Sumner uh, as Senator. Uh, Sumner, of course, is a fire breathing abolitionist and the Democrats did not like him at all, but they finally relented uh, and sent Sumner to the Senate in 1851. Uh, Wilson, I think, becomes president of the Massachusetts House and Banks becomes, or Senate, and Banks becomes Speaker of the House. Uh, but essentially, it was that uh, triumvirate of Wilson, Boutwell, and Banks that put together the coalition that then gets George Boutwell elected governor, uh, Sumner is, is senator, uh, and they go on from there. Now, of course, that doesn't, that coalition doesn't last very long. Um, party politics in the 1850s were incredibly fluid and ever-changing. You had the Know Nothing Party that arose for about a year, a, year, a very anti-nativist, anti-immigrant party in Massachusetts and in the North. Um, and the Free Soilers were, you know, kind of losing steam as well. And all of those um, influences combine into the birth of the Republican Party in 1854-55 of course, of which Henry Wilson and George Boutwell are incredibly important for launching the Republican Party in the state of Massachusetts, one of the most important of the Northern states for the Republicans, uh, but then uh, um, supporting Lincoln in the late 1850s, going to the convention in 1860, uh, and uh, you know, finally, and coalescing Republican support then. Yeah, so, um a little bit kind of before that Republican era still. Um, this, you know, kind of Banks, Boutwell, Wilson um, group, um, quoting from a one of Wilson's biographers, um, it seemed like uh, Banks and Boutwell had, you know, kind of a personal friendship and a political friendship, while um, the impression that Ernest McKay, who was one of Wilson's biographers, had was that 
um, Banks and Beltwell weren't as close with Wilson. They kind of treated him with um, some suspicion. Um, did you get that same impression? Um, or do you think that they were more, um, you know, engaged with each other um, rather than you kind of divided by like suspicion and, and more kind of ambition overriding their, their right. <clears throat> friendship, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, I've, uh, I've read the McKay material. It's, it's great stuff. I actually would modify that a little bit to say that all three of them were kind of playing their cards close to the vest. And yes, there was a connection between Banks and Boutwell for a time, but that didn't last. Um, by the 1860s, Nathaniel Banks is, I mean, they're still communicating. They're still in touch, of course, because they're Massachusetts and they're supporting the Union war effort. But I don't consider Nathaniel Banks to be one of George Boutwell's, you know, really close friends. Uh, so in that respect, I think each one of the three kind of came together in a marriage of convenience uh, in the coalition. And then, of course, working together to found the Republican Party. And then when Wilson goes to the Senate, uh, Banks goes to the House of Representatives. Boutwell is Commissioner of Internal Revenue, but then he goes to the House of Representatives. You know, they certainly had a lot of commonality of interests, uh, but I never really got the sense that all three of them were, uh, were bosom buddies. Right. Um, so another kind of early um, political career in Massachusetts um, was the Constitutional Convention, which um, of course, uh, George Boutwell was the chair of, mm -hmm. um, but Henry Wilson also played a large role in organizing that and participating in that. Um, could you speak kind of ab about um, Boutwell's role in the convention and also kind of the Constitutional Convention generally? Mm -hmm. um, Boutwell, and, and credit has to be given to Richard Henry Dana. Uh, he was the other major figure in the convention, but uh, you're right. In the end, it was George who did, you know, most of the work uh, in shepherding the convention through to agreement on the articles that were then submitted to the electorate in the fall uh, of 1853. They lost by very narrow margins uh, in the referendum. Uh, but well, I mean, I, I don't. I need to leaven my earlier remarks about George, you know, being. Uh, you know, not overly ambitious or putting ambition above principle, because I think he did always put principle first. But it's not to say that he wasn't an effective and wily politician. You know, he knew how to work the system, whether it was in the Massachusetts House or with Wilson and Banks to get elected governor, at, youngest governor at age 33 in the history of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, and then in the Constitutional Convention, one of the main aims of that convention was to at least in George's eyes, to rectify the inequities of the Massachusetts electoral system, which he thought were too heavily weighed towards the Whig dominance in Boston and other large urban locales to the, uh, the detriment of the farmers and laborers in central and western Massachusetts. So in one respect, the convention was an absolute, you know, cold eyed uh, attempt on Boutwell's part and others uh, to rectify the electoral system in Massachusetts. There were also issues of electing judges rather than appointing them uh, and other parts of the constitution as well. But it was very much a, a political exercise to, uh, to rectify what they saw as political imbalances in the electoral system in Massachusetts. Um, yeah, there's you know, the interesting story of how um, Wilson ran for both seats in uh, Boutwell. Natick, Natick in Berlin. Yes, Berlin, uh, yes. And Groton in Berlin. I, I love that story. George Boutwell gets defeated in his hometown of Groton, looks yeah. as if he won't be able to go to his own convention, but Henry Wilson has run in both Natick and Berlin, said, look, George, I won in Natick. I don't need Berlin. Why don't you go to Berlin and convince the people there to send you to the Constitutional Convention? Right, <laughs> exactly. It's. Um, interesting maneuvering yeah. um, by, by the men. Um, but um, so kind of moving on from Massachusetts um, politics and into, um, you know, the, the Civil War era. Um, so if you want to kind of explain um, what Boutwell's role was during the Civil War um, and any kind of interaction between Wilson uh, during that time and also generally with civil rights and, you know, the functioning of the war, um, you know, before the Reconstruction era and the Johnson era? Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, let's start in kind of 1859, 1860. Uh, Wilson and Boutwell are very important players in the, the National Republican Party. They're looking forward to the convention in Chicago in 1860, the one that will nominate Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Boutwell goes to the convention. He's asked to be part of the delegation that goes then from the convention to Springfield, Illinois, to notify Lincoln that he's been, uh, you know, formally nominated by the party and to get his acceptance. So Bightwell is getting known at that point in the upper reaches of the Republican Party as, of course, Henry Wilson's already in the U.S. Senate by, by that time. Uh, moving forward to early 1861, you've had the start of secession. South Carolina has seceded. Other southern states have followed them after Lincoln is elected in, 18, uh, in November 1860. And to me, one of the seminal events in George Boutwell's political career was the Virginia Peace Convention at the Willard Hotel in February of 1861. Most of the Southern states have already seceded, but not Virginia. Virginia obviously is key. If Virginia doesn't secede, there will be no rebellion, there'll be no Confederacy. So uh, John Tyler and other Virginians tell the federal government they want to hold a peace conference in uh, Washington to see if it can't be worked out that uh, you know slavery is protected at least in the uh, slave states if not in the western territories and civil war is avoided well it was a pretty transparent attempt on the part of virginia to uh, to delay things and try to get the north to to back down uh, they weren't really interested in compromise they saw it as a stalling maneuver a mechanism by which they could you know, win through peace, what uh, they hoped they wouldn't have to go to, to war for. George Boutwell was asked by John Andrew, governor of Massachusetts, to be part of the Massachusetts delegation. He goes to the Willard Hotel and he makes such an Im impact and such a, an impression on his fellow delegates that towards the end of that convention, the New York and New England delegates asked George to kind of give their rebuttal to the Southern delegates to tell them why, you know, we cannot back down. Abolition of slavery is absolutely necessary for the union to, to survive and to, to go forward. And there's a wonderful speech that George gives where he ends essentially by saying, look, you know, there can be no middle way. Either the South will march its armies to the Great Lakes or the Union Army will march to the Gulf of Mexico, but there will be no compromise. There'll be no middle way on slavery. It has to go. And it's an incredibly emotional uh, time and, and speech of his. It brings him to the attention of Lincoln who arrives on the very last day of that conference. Remember he travels incognito through Baltimore to come into Washington to be inaugurated. And that really to me kind of put George on Lincoln's radar. Uh, George then is appointed by Andrew to help coordinate the Massachusetts military contribution in the early months of, of the war. Uh, does a superb job on that. Sam and Chase sends him out to uh, Illinois to be on the Fremont Commission to look into irregularities of the uh, Western War Department. And so George, who had incredible administrative uh, and managerial skills, uh, is doing a great job helping coordinate the Massachusetts contribution to the war, looking into irregularities out in Cairo, Illinois, where Ulysses Grant was a young you know, army officer, not yet famous. Uh, and he is called back to Washington in July of 1862 to become the first commissioner of internal revenue uh, and an incredibly important position to help raise the needed funds for the union war effort with the introduction of the country's very first income tax in addition to all of the tariffs and trade duties and whatnot that have to be collected, remember, in the middle of a war, uh, an incredibly difficult, difficult job. Uh, he does that superbly for nine months, essentially starts with three clerks in the Treasury Department. And by the time he leaves nine months later, he's overseeing a staff of hundreds of, of people and thousands of tax collectors all across uh, the North uh, to efficiently raise money for the union war effort. From there, he's elected to Congress and then goes on for six years in Congress uh, to the next stage with the 14th and 15th Amendments. Right. Um, and uh, also um, during this period, he's, um, you know, kind of prominent in the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Um, so if you kind of want to review um, 
you know, what was his uh, perspective on the impeachment and his role in that? Mm-hmm. Um, for one thing, George Bywell never trusted Andrew Johnson. Uh, he just, others, others did, even Sumner uh, in the uh, summer of 1865, other diehard abolitionists, you know, they wanted to give Andrew Johnson a chance to prove himself after Lincoln's assassination. Uh, George Boutwell very quickly, and this comes from a meeting he had with Johnson in late May of 1865, barely a month after Lincoln has been killed and Johnson has assumed office, when Johnson is making moves in North Carolina and other Southern states to reconstitute Southern white governments uh, before Congress has even had a chance to um, implement reconstruction uh, uh, protections for blacks uh, and civil rights. So Boutwell is uh, is anti-Johnson from from the get-go. Everything he sees about Johnson throughout 1865 and 1866 convinces him that Johnson is gonna do anything he can to block congressional reconstruction. Uh, Boutwell writes an incredibly important article in the Atlantic Monthly in October of 1866 uh, called The Usurpation. He essentially accuses Johnson of usurping the powers of the federal government to the presidency, undermining Congress uh, and subverting the constitution. And I think the main thing I'd say about George's role in the impeachment process, of course it it lost, it failed by one vote uh, in uh, the spring of 1868. Um, Johnson stayed in power through the uh, election that fall. To me, George's biggest contribution to that whole impeachment process was his, I thought, very clear exposition that impeachment of a president did not have to constitute criminal offenses. It did not have to consist of indictable offenses that could be tried in a court of law. That impeachment was inherently a political process, that a president who's usurping power, who is demeaning Congress, undermining Congress, uh, vetoing bill after bill after bill, and not implementing the will of the people through Congress to uh, implement the 14th and 15th amendments uh, of the constitution, which are now part of the constitution, just as central as the bill of rights, that the president of the United States is actively undermining those elements of the constitution. So in December of 1867, George gives the first major pro impeachment uh, speech in the house of representatives Those articles do not succeed. Uh, They were voted down, but two months later, other articles are approved, but those focus narrowly, of course, on the uh, Tenure of Office Act, uh, the act by which uh, Edward Stanton is fired as Secretary of War, and many of the impeachment managers want to have a very legalistic basis on which to uh, pursue impeachment, so they concentrate almost totally on the Tenure of Office Act, and saying that Johnson has subverted that one piece of of legislation when George says, no, we really have to think of this in larger terms, more broad, broader terms of political malfeasance in office uh, that we think uh, necessitate impeachment. Um, So also um, during Reconstruction, you know, you mentioned um, uh, about Wells' role in the um, 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, so what did that look like in terms of, of legislating, um, getting, that, getting the language written in? And what was like the process of getting those amendments through and passed? Very, very difficult. Um, even with the Republicans having a, a, a clear majority uh, in Congress at the time, you still had many Northern white Republican, moderate Republicans who were not in favor of giving full equality to to blacks, either South or North. Uh, They did not want blacks voting in the North. They didn't want other immigrants or immigrants voting in the North, other peoples of color, uh, be it Chinese out West or the Irish uh, in the big cities of the North. And it took all of of George Boutwell's and other people as well, other members of Congress, all of their skills to craft compromises that a lot of the more moderate Republicans in Congress would buy into uh, to get the 14th and 15th amendments passed. Unfortunately, as many folks like Eric Foner on down have, have said, uh, you know, those were, were fatal 
not fatal flaws, but serious flaws in the amendments. The fact that there were no ironclad protections for allowing blacks to vote. The South would only be penalized if they denied blacks the vote, but there were no positive guarantees of making sure that blacks uh, could vote in the South. But it was the best that could be had at the time. And there was one great scene between uh, George Boutwell and Charles Sumner. Uh, Sumner is still the, the senator from Massachusetts, and he is, the, along with Thaddeus Stevens, you know, the two gods of, uh, of abolition and equal rights for black citizens in this country. And Sumner is furious that uh, George has had to compromise. He wants to go, you know, he wants maximum uh, protections for blacks. And George just has to say, look, Charles, it isn't going to pass. You can fight for this all you want, but it isn't going to pass. This is the best we can do. Uh, and that's why the, both 14th and 15th Amendments are kind of, they're saddled with the negative guarantees of penalizing the South if they, you know, uh, impair Black equality, as opposed to positive guarantees that will ensure that Blacks can show up the, at the voting booth and vote. Right. Um, so then after this, um, recon or I suppose after the kind of amendment process era, um, when Grant is elected and then, um, of course, the, um, the scandals of the Grant administration kind of prompt Wilson to be um, replaced as the nominee on the ticket um, for vice president, which, of course, um, allows for Boutwell to take over for Wilson in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you want to kind of go over um, Butwell's kind of ascension to the Senate um, and what that looked like in terms of, you know, kind of taking over for Wilson and how exactly he achieved that position. Okay. Um, I'll mention one episode, one of my favorite episodes first, while he's still Secretary of the Treasury, but to show his commitment to uh, equality, uh, civil equality for Blacks. On March 23rd, 1871, George is sitting in his office at the uh, Treasury Building, and Grant sends over a message that he wants George to hurry over and ride with him in the presidential carriage up to Capitol Hill. But what they do is go up to Capitol Hill, and they're, they convince Congress to pa pass what is known as the Third Enforcement Act. It's now known as the KKK Act, Ku Klux Klan Act. Uh, but it was an enforcement act by which, again, Congress was trying to do everything it could to protect the 14th and 15th Amendment uh, um, assurances to, uh, to black citizens in the South. Uh, so George is still, even though he's running the Treasury Department, the biggest department in the federal government, and just he's got you know, uh, a welter of, of details to attend to, he's still committed enough to, to Grant's agenda of protecting Reconstruction that he goes with Grant up to Capitol Hill to help Congress pass the uh, KKK Act. Two years later, as you mentioned, or even just a, a year later in 1872, uh, he is uh, elected to Congress to replace Henry Wilson, takes office in 1873 and finishes out the four years of Wilson's term uh, and does what he can. Admittedly, Reconstruction is dying. Uh, the North is tired of Reconstruction. Uh, they want to move on with reconciliation with the South. They want to get on with rebuilding the country economically. Uh, most of, or much of the support that had come from the North for uh, abolition and emancipation is now dying. It's fading away and Reconstruction is on its last legs. Uh, George does what he can to, you know, continue to wave that flag or the bloody shirt as it was known in, in the Senate. Uh, and that led to what I had talked about previously, my perhaps most famous episode of George Cherry met the uh, Senate Select Committee in 1876 that looks into white atrocities, white supremacist violence against blacks in the South and leads to a uh, 2000 page report, which didn't admittedly make much difference at the time. The country was moving on but it's, you know, when you ask me, why are people like Wilson and Boutwell important, or why are they important? It's for things like this, that there are historical records that they helped compile at the time that still exist today that give to the lie to Southern white redemption, to the lost cause of the Confederacy, to uh, the, the myth that, uh, you know, Southern whites tried to, uh, uh, with a very 
uh, effectively that they uh, perpetrated for over a century uh, in terms of uh, race relations in this country. Yeah, so very interesting. Um, so after, of course, Wilson dies um, in 75, and so that kind of ends um, their kind of linkage there, but Bellwell goes on to continue his political career. Um, so if you want to kind of go over what what he, what he his, you know, uh, kind of resume looked like after, um, you know, his, his term in the Senate and after um, all that, like what, what accomplishments did he have then? Mm-hmm. Um, as I do that, I'm going to ask you a question first, because, of course, George Boutwell loses the Senate in 1876, uh, and he's replaced uh, by uh, Henry Dawes, I believe. Um, but the important thing is the reason he loses that Senate election in 1876 is because of Benjamin Butler, uh, one of the most kind of infamous characters, uh, political figures of uh, Civil War and Reconstruction. And the question for you is, did Benjamin Butler and Henry Wilson, what kind of a relationship did they have? Because of course, Butler was a machine politician and just a political operator from the word go. Uh, he, you know, he would put the knife in anybody who stood in his way if, uh, you know, as he tried to succeed politically. That's what he did to George Boutwell in 1876. Uh, and I'm just curious about the relationship he and Henry Wilson might have had. Yeah. I. I, I... I recall his name coming up frequently. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, of the, the later, uh, you know, kind of the relationship that Wilson and, and he had. I know that he was okay. Butler was less of a, wasn't really in the radical Republican category. If, if I'm remembering correctly, he was kind of a more, much more moderate. Um, that That's really my extent of, of how much I know. Um, I, I do know him as kind of, in my mind, he's he is that kind of machine politician, um, but I, I don't know much about their interaction. Yeah. Okay. Um, just a short digression. I find it interesting. I I don't think there's a full kind of modern biography of, of Ben Butler, and he's one of those people that should have one because he just he, you know, as distasteful a character as he was, uh, much of the time he deserves you know a full examination for his role in American history. Uh, beginning in the eight and during the Civil War, he was the commander of the New Orleans district uh, when it was uh, captured by the, the Union Army in the early 1860s. He then did serve in the House of Representatives. And actually, for a period there, he was a radical Republican. He was a member of the impeachment committee with George Boutwell uh, against Andrew Johnson. And it was actually Ben Butler who gave the final closing argument for the prosecution uh, in the U.S. Senate just before Johnson was acquitted. Uh, he was a, he was a, um, a brilliant guy uh, and a superb lawyer. But of course, you know, lawyers are often, you know, the better the snake, the better the lawyer. Uh, and that was Ben Butler. I mean, he just, he knew how to turn a courtroom upside down and inside out. Uh, but he was a radical Republican as a uh, representative in the 1860s. Uh, he then was thrown out of office, came back to office, was elected governor of Massachusetts for a short period, just had a, a really interesting checkered career. Uh, but uh, that essentially, Ben Butler had as much to do as, as anybody with having George lose his Senate election in 1876. Um, I'll be very brief on really what is the next 30 years of George Boutwell's life, because he, he leaves office in 1877 in the Senate and he doesn't die until 1905. Now that's a hell of a long time in which he continued to the very end to read, to write, to speak, uh, speak out on public issues. Uh, he was always involved, um, even when he was out of office. Um, starting with within two weeks of uh, Benjamin Harrison, uh, taking or Rutherford B. Hayes taking over as president in 1877, he asks George Boutwell to oversee the monumental revision of the entire U.S. legal code uh, between 1877 and 78. George Boutwell took a year to do it and published, you know, a totally updated, annotated uh, compendium of the U.S. legal code, all of the acts of Congress, all of the Supreme Court decisions. Uh, he was a guy who never went to college or law school. He totally self-taught, but that's how you know highly he was regarded for his mastery of both constitutional law, then later international law in the 1880s. He serves on 
international claims commissions involving France, Chile, Haiti, uh, and he becomes counsel to the Kingdom of Hawaii uh, in uh, 1886. At just that time that, you know, the white planter class in Hawaii is taking over the island shortly before it gets annexed to the US, which of course, uh, well, totally opposed. So he is working in the international sphere for these 20 years. And then his uh, peeration, the apotheosis of his career comes in 1898 with the Spanish-American War, which he didn't oppose necessarily because he, you know, he knew as everyone did that the Spanish were, you know, had a, uh, were cruel, uh, had a cruel empire and were, you know, subjugating the Cubans, Filipinos, Puerto Ricans, whatnot. Uh, he wasn't necessarily sorry to see Spain kicked out of the Western Hemisphere, but he was totally opposed to the U.S. plans for annexing the Philippines, for sending American soldiers to occupy the Philippines, to fight Filipino insurgents, to deny them independence. And in the last five, six, seven years of his life, he took the principles that he had honed during the Civil War for uh, consent of the governed, Republican government, equal rights, full citizenship, and applied those to the, uh, the issue of the Philippines in opposing McKinley and then Teddy Roosevelt and their plans for annexing uh, uh, the Philippines and the 10 million people living there. Yeah, very interesting. Such a, a wide variety career that lasted <clears throat> so long. You know, you don't find individuals that, you know, were alive for that period and, and involved actively. Um, so that's that's kind of a real fascination about Boutwell. <clears throat> but those are all kind of my core questions I had for you. Um, the one the one other kind of side thing was, um, did Boutwell have kind of a large uh, like papers collection? Because I know Wilson um, did not really have any um, and all of his papers are, are really scattered around a different, mm -hmm. you know, uh, institutions. But it, it seems like there's a pattern of um, these men who <clears throat> didn't weren't formally educated, um, not keeping their papers in order. What when you have someone like Sumner, who you know was a part of the aristocracy, yeah. who right. very well maintained, and which is you know part of the reason why he's so, um, you know, why he's placed in in these in um, such prominence mm -hmm. um, when these other kind of um, less aristocratic or, or not aristocratic at all members are are not. Um, so did Boutwell have you know what was what were his papers like? Um, that has been an absolute stroke of luck uh, in the work that I've been doing on George. Yes, there are tons of papers. Uh, they're not cataloged. They're not organized. Um, you have to go through them banker's box by banker's box. But we're very lucky, or I'm very lucky, but I think the, the country is very lucky in the sense that um, Boutwell lived in Groton, Mass. for 70 years. Uh, never moved after he moved there as a teenager in 1835. Uh, dies in 1905. His daughter, Georgiana, uh, an incredibly you know, smart intellectual person in her own right, gifted writer. Uh, she really was her father's uh, companion, political advisor in Washington, DC. When George dies in 1905, Georgiana uh, lives until 1933 in the same house. And in 33, she deeded the, the house, the very nice Victorian uh, Italian uh, mansion on Main Street in Groton. She deeded it to the Groton Historical Society, which she herself had started back in the 1890s. So all of the possessions, all of the furnishings, all the papers that George had are still in the Bowell House. They are transferred to the Groton Historical Society in 1933, uh, and they're still very much there. And uh, I've been up now, what, six or eight times uh, going through the closets. And as I said, they're just in bankers boxes. One might have all of his letters to family. Another has all of his letters to political colleagues. Another has his scrapbooks of articles that he uh, uh, compiled. Another has a scrapbook of his articles that he wrote. He was, he was kind of like the Mike Barnacle uh, of his day for the Boston Globe back in the late 1880s, early 1890s. He was a regular opinion columnist for the Boston Globe over about a five year period, writing on everything under the sun from horticulture the newest agricultural methods, the electoral college and how it should be you know, reformed, 
to the, uh, the foreign affairs, what's going on with the annexation of Hawaii, uh, kind of every issue under the sun he wrote about for the Boston Globe. And it's nice just to track those articles over a period of time that he was writing. So a lot of material there. As I said, it's, it's been only very loosely organized. Uh, there's no central database that uh, you know, lets you know what's there and what's not there. Uh, but there's been plenty of material, thank God, for, for my purposes uh, in learning more about George. Um, well, thank you so much again for Good. your time. Um, I look forward to, to being in contact in the Wonderful. future. Thanks, thank Link. You. I enjoyed it. Yep. Yes, great. Have yep. a good night. You too. Bye-bye.